Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. And I'm actually gonna do these weekly now. I was gonna start last week and then nothing really happened, so I thought I would just start this week. So I do intend to do these every week now. So this is the 28th of June. New videos since the last update? Uh, none. I've not been completely lazy. And uh, what actually happened is I have a whole bunch of plural site courses and I had six of them to update. So for basically eight days, I was updating six different courses, the core compute, network and storage courses, all got an update. I updated the Azure files, course of information about private link and AD integration. I added a whole governance section to the identity and governance design course and updated the authorization course. And these are all free. You can go and sign up for in that link and you don't need the credit card. You can access a whole bunch of Microsoft training materials for nothing. And then last week I had strep, and so yeah, lazy uh, for that week. So what's new? Um, Azure AD has actually got a bunch of cool stuff, not all new in the last week, but stuff you may not be aware of, and I wanted to make sure kind of was known. The first is, there's different SKUs of Azure AD. I license users kind of per month. And it used to be, there was a limited number of kind of federated apps, single sign-on apps I could add for users that were part of kind of the free SKU that has actually gone away. So I can now have unlimited single sign-on even for free SKU people. So these could be gallery apps, non-gallery, OAuth, SAML, OpenID Connect, doesn't matter. I can now have an unlimited number of single sign-in apps even for free SKU Azure AD users. That, that's pretty huge. Administrative units, uh, they are in public preview. And this is the idea that Azure AD is basically flat. If we're used to Active Directory, we have kind of a structure. We have organizational units. Those organizational units are really good for delegating authority. What I can now do with admin units, I can put a user into multiple administrative units, and then I can delegate um, people to have roles at the administrative unit level. So I could put all users from a certain team into an administrative unit, and then give someone the ability to just manage the users in that administrative unit, it's like a local team administrator. So it gives me now the ability to delegate. So I'll give you a certain role at a scope, which is now an administrative unit, instead of all of Azure AD. So it gives you more granular delegation. And then a whole bunch of fun with tokens. And really three new capabilities around tokens. The first is this user sign-in frequency. Now there was this configurable token lifetime feature. It let me set how long a token would last. That has actually kind of been deprecated. That's going away, it never got out of preview. So what this lets me do is through uh, conditional access, I actually set a policy. Now as part of the session access controls, I set this sign in frequency. This is in hours or days. Now because it's conditional access, it does mean Azure AD Premium P1 or P2. Now, normally, I have a refresh token. So when I go and access a certain resource through a client, remember we always have kind of the authorization server, we have the resource server, and then there's the client that I've kind of delegated permission to. And they get an authorization code from me, and then they get kind of that refresh token and an access token. And they go and use the access token to access a resource. Now, access tokens are very, very short-lived, normally one hour. But what I do is I use my refresh token to say, hey, uh, authorization server, I need a new access token so I can carry on using that particular resource. Now, that's 90 days and it's rolling. So every time I use it to get a new access token, I get a new refresh token for another 90 days. So essentially I, I can stay on forever. If I was offline for 90 days, then I'll have to kind of re-authenticate. So what this policy says is, well, actually, I'm gonna make you re-sign in at a certain frequency. So for this particular app, because this is conditional access, it's based on a certain app, this app, um, it's not gonna just be that 90 day rolling window. I'm gonna make you re-authenticate. Now, if I'm on an Azure AD join machine, for example, and I do an authentication, well, that will count if I log on, if I unlock the device. If there's MFA, that will also be included as required as part of that signing frequency. 
So now for certain apps, I can say, hey, no, I want you to re-authenticate every four hours or eight hours. Now be careful with this. Constantly making people re-authenticate seems like a good idea, but it's not. If we train people to always authenticate, then it's just muscle memory. I'll, I'll just authenticate all the time. So if there's a malicious prompt to authenticate, I'm not gonna detect something's weird. It's better to make people authenticate based on, hey, uh, I'm detecting a heightened risk using identity protection. Remember, if they change their password, if they are disabled, if they're deleted, that will invalidate refresh tokens anyway. But this capability, uh, it, it does now exist. The second one is this continuous access evaluation. So this is pretty cool, and it kind of goes back to this token idea. Remember I said I had that access token? That's normally 60 minutes, and there's nothing I can do. Once I have an access token, I'm good. I can disable the account over here, doesn't matter. That access token is, is solid. There's nothing I can do to revoke that access token. But now I can. So what this continuous access evaluation does it enables resource services to kind of subscribe to critical events. So a critical event could be something like um, user has been disabled, um, password has changed, MFA has been enabled, the refresh token has been revoked. There's some other conditions. But now it can get told. So now what it can do is it can say, hey, even though it's been given an access token that should be okay, if I got notification that some critical event has happened, I'm gonna reject that token. Now today, and this will expand, when we talk about these resource servers, this is kind of Exchange today and Teams today. So the clients this works with is kind of Outlook and Teams. They're the only two that are doing that today, and that's on macOS, Windows, Android, and iOS. So it works across all of them. So those two clients understand that, hey, they might get challenged and said, no, I'm not gonna use this token. Then you'll have to go and get a new um, access token and then it'll give it a new access token. So that quick event happens, hey, MFA's been turned on. I'm not gonna let you use your token. Okay, I'll go and get a new one. Oh, well, because something's happened here, it's gonna invalidate my refresh token. It would make me re-authenticate. Then I'll get a new refresh token, new access token. And I'll be able to access the service. So that's pretty cool. So that would actually allow us now to react even though that access token is still valid. So critical happens, I wanna kill that user's ability to access my email or Teams. I can actually now do that. That's pretty cool. Persistent browser sessions. So this is another conditional access. So again, it's an Azure AD Premium P1 or P2. I can only set it for all cloud apps. So in my policy, I have to do it for all cloud apps. If you've ever signed in to the Azure portal or, or anything in a browser, you authenticate, and once you've finished authenticating, it's got that keep me signed in. And you say, keep me signed in. So what that does is kind of the refresh token that I got as part of the authentication is now persistent refresh token. It's stored as a persistent cookie in my browser, and I can actually go and see these cookies. So now that persistent cookie, even though I close the browser, and start it again, I'm still signed in. Um, if I say no, it's cookies only good for the session. Then I'll have to re-authenticate um, when I reopen the browser again. What this conditional access policy does is override that. I can actually say yes, keep signed in, or no, don't let them sign in. So that will override any behavior they would have got through kind of that uh, GUI experience. So some cool new things all around the tokens. ARM templates, also some good stuff. Hopefully everyone's using ARM templates. Well, not, not ARM, could be Terraform, that's, that's cool. I mentioned this before, what if? Now I can say, hey, if I deploy this template, what's it gonna do? Hey, it's gonna change this SKU, it's gonna make these changes. So that's there. VS Code has got a super cool update to the Azure Resource Manager template tools. So now there's snippets. I can just start typing, so I can start typing ARM and it will actually, hey, do you wanna create a deployment to a resource group, to a subscription, to a management group, all these capabilities. It's gonna validate, so it understands the schema of the objects, 
So if I take out, I'm missing a critical element that must be there, it will prompt me and say, hey, this is no good. Uh, this is failing validation. It's all color coded. It's got auto completion because of that schema knowledge. Um, I can do comments. Um, whack, whack. Comment. That's going to work if I deploy it through PowerShell, Portal, et cetera, et cetera. We now have a deployment scripts resource um, that I can use within my ARM template. Now, you may be thinking, big deal, I have that already. No, you don't. What you have today is for a virtual machine, scale set, I can do a custom script extension, I can do a run command, and that runs something, but it's running inside that resource. This is saying, hey, I'm deploying an ARM template, a bunch of stuff, then I need to run some commands. I don't want to run those commands inside a resource that I'm deploying. I just need to run these commands. Like ordinarily I might be sitting at the console once I've done the deployment and I run these few commands to tweak the config or do something. Now I can run that script either in line or passing it a script and it will actually get run as part of the ARM deployment. Now the way this works is it creates a temporary kind of storage account and a temporary container that will execute even my PowerShell or my bash that I specify as part of that resource. So again, this is not run this script inside of this thing I'm deploying in the template. This is, hey, I've deployed this stuff. Hey, I also need to run these commands. This will now do that. So that's actually pretty cool. And I can now deploy management groups and subscriptions uh, through my ARM template. So if I think large scale uh, deployment of environments, my, my EA environment, I can now define all of that in a template. Azure Compute, uh, ephemeral OS disks can now be stored on the temp disk in addition to VM cache. So some of the sort of the big VMs have a cache. This helps obviously with storage performance. I get a certain size cache. You go and look at the M series, the GS, some of the others, they have a cache size. That's different from the temporary disk. So this cache, I use that for ephemeral OS disks. So these are OS disks that are not stored on remote storage, i.e. a managed disk. So what this instead does with an ephemeral disk is if I think about behind the scenes, essentially, there is a host. So there's a host, and that host has a certain amount of kind of local storage, has a certain amount of local cache, whatever. And then my VM gets created. Now, ordinarily, my OS disk, well, there's Azure storage. And when I say, hey, create a managed disk, it goes and creates a storage account for me, and it links that managed disk where it's replicated, it's stored three times, it's very resilient. But that's remote storage, and this kind of costs me money. So with ephemeral OS disks, it stores it actually locally on the host. So normally it would store it in the cache. So there's kind of the cache on that host, and instead it would put the OS disk on that. But what if I have a VM series that doesn't have a cache, but it does have a temporary disk. Well, now I can store that OS temporary disk on there as well. So again, it's ephemeral. When I deprovision this thing, it goes away, but I don't care. This is a stateless workload. It's a VM, it's a virtual machine scale set. I don't need the state to persist. Benefit is obviously I'm not paying for a managed disk and it's local to the host. So the latency is gonna be super, super low. So now, we have those additional choices. Uh, yes, cache, or I can use my temp storage if I don't have enough cache or don't have any cache. I can use a temp disk. If I have both, I get to pick. There's now a five year reserved instance. So reserved instance is where I'm saying, hey, I know I'm gonna need this much resource for a certain period of time, should get a discount. It's like checking into a hotel. If I'm gonna be staying there for three months and I tell them I'm gonna pre-book for three months, I get a cheaper rate. Well, now I can actually do a five year reserved instance uh, for the HBV2 to get even bigger discounts than the one or the three year term. Networking, um, network insights. You're gonna see this across nearly all Azure services. We've got these new insight capabilities. These are part of Azure Monitor. And it's basically a curated experience. The people that own that feature in Azure are actually creating these insights inside Azure Monitor to bring to the forefront the key metrics, um, the events, the best practices, the things you really need to know. Well now, Network Insights has a load balancer component. So that load balancer configuration will show me the dependencies. Well, hey, I've got this front end 
um, based on these ports going to these back end VMs and VM scale sets. Um, key metrics like availability of the front end, availability of the back end, data throughput. That's all now going to show just built in uh, as part of kind of that load balancer component of the network insights. Azure Storage, uh, GZRS and RAGZRS on our GA. So remember, if we think about what does that mean within an Azure region, many of them have availability zones. I can think about availability zone as kind of a certain facility that has independent cooling and power and networking. So with ZRS for my storage account, remember there's always three copies. Well now my storage account essentially kind of spans those three AZs and there's a copy of my data in each of the three um, AZs. That would be ZRS. So now we have the GZRS. Remember regions are paired. So there's a paired region. So now my data is asynchronously replicated to the paired region where there is also three copies of it stored. So GZRS is ZRS storage in the primary, three AZs, asynchronously replicated where there's then three copies just in the remote. It's not ZRS on the other side, not today, um, it's just three copies of it. The RA just means I have read-only access to that side for services that support um, read-only access, log for example. So that is now GA. Um, the other point, my next kind of Azure storage, is storage account customer initiated failover is also now GA. So what that means is ordinarily this pairing, uh, it would only fail over if there was kind of a region outage that Microsoft decided we're going to fail over. Now as the customer, I can initiate that failover. So if I decide, hey, something's going on, I want this to fail over, I can actually go in, I can say, hey, I want to initiate a failover. It will show me the last time this async replication happened because it is async. Uh, there will be data loss if it's constantly sending things. It will show me this was the last sync time, i.e. you're gonna lose any data since this time. If I say yes, go ahead, it will then flip the DNS. So instead of pointing here, now my storage account will point over here and now I'll be able to access it. It will be LRS. If I want to reverse the replication, I'll switch it back to GRS where it will start replicating that way. So that is also now GA. So I control when I want it to fail over. And finally, um, Azure Key Vault. It has insights now as well. So details about interactions, latencies, failures, um, that stuff is all just going to show. So I hope that was useful. Again, I'm going to do these weekly from now on. Um, hopefully it won't be lazy. I'll get some other videos up. I've got some things going on. Uh, if this was useful, please uh, like, comment, subscribe. And until next week, take care.